now watching West Harper Community yeah. Television. You're watching West Harper Community Television. You're watching West Harper Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hello and welcome to Art Talks. I'm Joanne Bauer. And I'm Mike DeRosa. Art Talks is a TV interview show providing uh, an opportunity for artists in the greater Hartford area, uh, an opportunity to come in here and to speak about their artwork and their creative process, and also gives us and you, the audience, an opportunity to hear our talks. Today, our guests, and welcome very much, we have our guests today are Angela Werner, who is a practitioner of a special process called Zentangle that she's going to describe for us. And currently, she has an exhibit at the West Hartford Library. And our second guest is Carol Gannick, who is also an instructor, an artist, a painter. And she works uh, as an instructor at the West Hartford Art League. We welcome you both today. And yeah, thanks for being here. Thank Angela, you. let's start with you, because we're all curious about this process that's brand new to us called Zentangle. What can you tell us? Okay, so nobody knows anything when you say Zentangle. They think, well, is it a dance or something? <laughs> and no, it isn't. It's a method of creating abstract art through the use of structured uh, patterns. Mm -hmm. So you learn the patterns, and then there is an actual process of how you start. So the people who started Zentangle are uh, Rick Roberts and Maria Thomas. Excellent. And she was a calligrapher and is a calligrapher. Mm -hmm. And Rick was a monk, a Buddhist monk, for okay. 17 years. So they combine their expertise and their love and put it together into this form that we have known as Zentangle. Now, I know um, you brought some tools, and we want to see some of that, but I'm curious okay. how you got into this. What attracted you or appealed to you about okay, this process? Okay, I, I first learned about Centangle when I was teaching at Covenant Prep in Hartford, which is a school for boys from fifth grade through eighth. And uh, one day I was going down um, to talk to another teacher, and in the cafeteria after school were a group of boys very quietly busily doing something and that immediately brought me into the room wondering what are they doing? <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> and they were um, doing some very elemental strokes of Zentangle and I saw the kit you know that was there Zentangle and so I went to the website and fell in love with it. Oh my goodness. And that was the last year that I was teaching at Covenant Prep. I, I'm retired now, and I thought, what am I going to do to keep me a little busy and in the arts? Because I have to have art in my life. Yes. And so I looked into getting certified, and I did. I went to Rhode Island, and for a four-day uh, seminar, I became certified to teach this Wonderful. process. Wonderful. And one of the things that's wonderful about Zentangle is that everything you need can, is in a little bag like this. <laughs> you know, you just, in your first class, you get your little bag, and inside it is um, the tiles. We call them tiles. They come from Italy, and it's a very special kind of paper with a very um, nice tooth to it. And... Um, these are three by three and a half by three and a half in size, and then there are we use Sakura pens that are micro micron 101 and micron 08, mm -hmm. and, and then a pencil to um, start, 
and a tortillon, which is helps you in the shading. Yes, the, so, yes. This is called what again? A tortillon. Yes. Okay. Very good. It's just to spread the um, spread the shading. Right. So, if you want to know just how do you start a yeah. zentangle? How do you start? Okay. So. I would like to show you something here because it gives you the actual steps from um, Rick and Maria's book. And Wonderful illustrations. Yeah, they're, they're really, it's, it's by my bedside all the time. I think <laughs> it's absolutely gorgeous. So these are the tiles that we use. And what Rick and Maria wanted to do is bring a process to people, anybody, who wants to put a little effort into this can learn the process and then can, you know, participate and to the, teach into it the also, practice. Right. right. So um, they wanted everybody to have this opportunity. It's like, it's not art for the masses. It's art by the masses. Yes, wonderful. So what they did is they created a structure that helps people get started. So you put four dots along the side, you create a border, and then you divide that space within the border with what's called a string. And it's any shape you want. You can close your eyes and create a string, or you can use somebody else's string. But it just breaks it apart, and that's like taking away the fear of the empty canvas. That's uh, very zen-like. I can see how his background was Absolutely. brought into the process. Exactly. Fascinating. It's like you don't go into creating a zentangle tile with a preconceived notion of what you want. It's you're going <laughs> through, you're letting it happen. So maybe, Angela, you could talk a little bit about the spontaneity part of that, because earlier you said, I have to do art. Yes. So maybe you can talk about that and the idea of the spontaneity and how does that all work. Okay. So when you begin a tile, you really don't know how it's going to end up. And all the surprises that can happen within the process is what delights and keeps me going back to it. And the artwork itself, the process, teaches me so much about art and also about life because you're supposed to do a very deliberate stroke and one stroke at a time, you learn how to do a particular pattern. You put the pattern into a space, you put another pattern into the second space, the third space, and you're done. What happened? How do the patterns interact with each other? What, ha what creates what exists there that was a total surprise to you? So there is an analytical part to the process, too. What do you mean by analytical? You judge not judge, but perhaps evaluate what is happening as you go. All right. One of the things that we're urged to do is to suspend judgment all along. That's something I tell my students. Right. Yes. Don't let the little voice in the back of your head that's saying, this is not any good. What are you doing? It's so ugly so far. And you suspend judgment, and you just submit to the elements, submit to the elemental strokes and see what happens. Of course, little ideas come into your head about, you know, what should I do next or what pattern do I know that I could put right here that will, and of course, I bring myself to Zentangle as does everybody who does it, and I have an art background, so of course, I'm, all, I'm thinking balance, variety, contrast, unity, um, all of the principles of design. Mm -hmm. And I'm judging because that's who I am. But if you don't have those concepts, mm -hmm. you may just go with instinct. You know, mm -hmm. looks good to have something straight with something circular, with something light, with something dark, values, you know. Right. So what influences my work is that I know about the principles of design. Yes, and that's apparent. So it comes out. But if it's brand new to you, then it's a discovery to you. And oh. that's what I love about doing it and about teaching it, because it's simple enough so that if you create a Zentangle tile in your very first class, you can be proud of what you've done. Can I show you a little collage of what um, 
Yes, the and while, first you're, while you're getting that out, I want to mm -hmm. just say that there are many connections here, mm -hmm. as Carol was pointing to. I know, Carol, you've talked quite a bit in, your, in the preview um, about how you're in, interested in creating the same spontaneity in your work and it, with your students, too. And it, there's, would you want to just speak a little bit to that? Well, I think when you mentioned the whole idea of discovery, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the most important things for an artist. Mm -hmm. Because if you always know where you're going, there's very little What's surprise the point, right? or, <laughs> or joy. And what is the point? I mean, for some people, perhaps knowing where they're going and learning the process is important. And I'm not taking away from technical expertise. No, Te not me Technique either. is very important mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing a painting or a drawing. But I think that you have to allow for something magical to happen, mm -hmm. something surprising to happen, and you have to risk that maybe nothing magical will happen. <laughs> you also, right. yeah, and you, exactly. also, you also have to take the chance that, or you have to realize that if you're a beginner, what you're doing might be much better than you think it is. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. So, maybe we could talk risk. about the idea of serendipity or of unconscious elements kind of coming out of you? Is this a kind mm -hmm. of a, an expressionism or is it more like a, uh, a, a kind of a, a little puzzle, a game that you begin a process? How does the process mm -hmm. work for either one of you? Maybe well, each of you could talk about what it is that you, what, what's your intentionality when you start and how does that change as you go through the process? Mm -hmm. Well, what I wanted to show is that this is a first class. Uh, these are students that I had at the library right. and this is their very first yeah. uh, attempt and they're given they're shown four different patterns and they're told about what string to use and yet look at the variety right. and oh. they're all surprised and they're all amazed so talk about serendipity I mean look at the partic this particular one right in here if you can see she created by accident a bird in the in her negative space, right. Right. and she saw it and kept it. And I'm thinking, oh, that is wonderful. If you can stop and see what you're doing, and one of the things we're told to tell the students all the time and to do ourselves is to hold the piece you're working on at arm's length, to turn it upside down and sideways because there is the story, there is the magic. If you're looking like this, uh, then you don't see all of the surprises. You can really understand how students would be attracted to this art mm. form. You mentioned negative space, and I would mm -hmm. like us to define that for the mm -hmm. audience, if yeah, either great. one of you wants to. Okay, negative space is the space in which you don't draw or you don't paint. It's the absence of what you are actually doing. Can you elaborate? On uh, that? Well, it's sometimes it's a, it's a hard. It would be an easier concept to show you, but mm -hmm. if, for example, this shape here were the object, uh, perhaps a praying mantis, <laughs> the negative shape would be what's around mm -hmm. the praying mantis. Right. And uh, it, it can change. Mm -hmm. There can be a negative space within your object, too, when you're painting. Right. Um, so it's, it's part, of the, part of the process. It's yeah. part of the serendipity. Yes. And I would think that in these pieces in particular, the negative space could change. For example, when you have mm -hmm. that space that's very much Escher-like. Mm -hmm. We know with Escher's work, we're, we're right. not that sure which is foreground, Escher's background. Work comes up a lot mm -hmm. when people look at it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one of the little surprises about it is that I love to title my work. Not everybody does, but sometimes... You know, it, it's what emerges. Not only does the artwork emerge, but your title <laughs> right. comes to be afterwards. <laughs> you know, so this one, which I created about uh, this afternoon, because I was like thinking oh, about this interview and everything, and I thought it would calm me and settle me and uh -huh. center me about what I do. And so I did this piece, and 
you know, it, it's, it ended up being called Ode to Chocolate Chip. Yeah. <laughs> and you can, it, with any Zentangle, if it's a true Zentangle, no matter how you see it and which way you turn it, it has its own life. Yeah. That's wonderful. And if it, ha but you know, speaking of Zentangle and whether or not it's a Zentangle, if you have something like color in the one in front, then yes, talk it, about that I mean, process. Because yeah. we had chocolate chips and we also <laughs> have tea here. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, if you have a recognizable image or you have color or the size is different than the three by three, then it's what we call the Zia or a Zentangle inspired art. Oh. And this would qualify as a Zia because the center has color. And, so, and we were talking about this prior to the taping of the show, and somebody said, well, what is that painting? And I said, tea. And they said, tea, you know. But actually, I used tea and a little bit of um, a squeezed uh, blueberry in there with a little bit of orange juice. And <laughs> tastes you know, good. If, <laughs> right. I'm if, getting hungry. <laughs> if you go to Zentangle.com and you, you go under, under blog, Maria Thomas, who is an incredible artist, does show all of her work weekly, and she's my muse. And it was, I was inspired by one of the pieces that she did that had a little bit of a, a pond in the, in the side, and so I created my own. And um, It kind of looks to me like you're, you're starting with an abstract idea, and then all of a sudden you're getting this abstract pattern that you created, but it mm -hmm. looks to me like a sky. Or, uh, or, uh, interesting. See, know, every, so everybody the has piece, a different interpretation, yeah. The piece isn't over until the viewer right. comes oh. in. Yeah, why don't the we talk about that? Why don't we talk about how the, uh, I know in a couple things that I've done, uh, I've gotten responses from people who look at it, and they come up with completely different interpretations, Absolutely. which in my way of looking at it are as valid as my idea about the word. Maybe you could, Carol, talk about, you yeah. know, someone were to look here, you talked about a praying mantis there. Uh, maybe someone was, you know, would be looking at this work. Maybe tell us about it a little bit. Well, this is called Almost, oops, Almost Paris. Almost Paris, okay. <laughs> and um, it's a painting that I did a number of years ago. Uh, my husband and I were planning a trip to Paris at the time. And I was, at that point, I had a studio at the Farmington Valley Art Center, so I was able to paint very large, large paintings, some larger than this. And uh, we were getting ready, and I think the trip was a couple of weeks away, and my husband <coughs> broke his arm. And so we had to cancel the trip. But I was in the midst of painting this, and I think it was the color, the movement, the excitement of the piece that made me think of the title, Almost Paris. I um, painted abstractly for a number of years uh, without reference to anything uh, specific in nature. But I found that uh, the longer I painted in the abstract mode, the more I was drawn back to realism uh, or at least impression of reality. Mm -hmm. And so I, I consider myself now more of a person who gets moods and feelings of landscapes rather than a landscape painter. Now, in and contrasting yes. and comparing that to the other piece there, here you have a lot of color, there you've got black and white, yeah. and you've got another element which is a picture or an image within another image. Yeah. So is there some, is, is that front image there a, a painting and then there's reality behind it or is it's it? It's not quite as complicated as that. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, it, you see, it I'm projecting into it. You, you, you know, that particular drawing, I think, is one that uh, kind of exemplifies the way I feel about exploration and discovery in creating a painting, particularly if you're going the abstract route, but also in, in painting uh, a landscape. Uh, sometimes you start with a, a stroke or a line or a patch of paint and then you add something else to it. And your mind, your thoughts, your feelings about 
the world and reality and nature oftentimes come into that process. But as you go, you try to maintain a intuitive feeling about it as well as the knowledge that you have of what a tree looks like or what rocks look like. And in my work specifically, uh, even now, uh, which may be much more representational than either of these pieces, I try to keep that feeling. In this particular drawing, and I believe that drawing is something that you, you, can, you can do whenever you can't paint. It's right. wonderful to, to spend time mm -hmm. drawing, to just take a pencil and paper, and that's why I can really appreciate what you do mm -hmm. with, the, with the little package of materials. Uh, as a painter, I'm loaded with paints and canvases right. and paper, and my husband's also a painter, and between the two of us, we've really filled up the house. <laughs> but um, in this one, I think I started with the inner image mm -hmm. and felt it needed some strength, and the idea of the square came in and moving out of the square. So it, it was a thought process as well as an intuitive process. And for me, it's a landscape within a forest or a landscape within an abstract painting. Yeah, we totally can see that. And Carol, you have your hand on a piece here, a smaller piece that I would say is more representational than the two that we've discussed. Do yes. you want to talk a bit about? This is an oil painting. And oh. recently, well, just in the past few years, I've, I've kind of gone... I haven't left painting in watercolor and acrylic, but I've explored a little bit more with um, oils. And um, this piece is basically for me, although a little more representational, still is much more emotionally the feeling of little sand and water and trees. It, uh, it keeps a little bit of that feeling of the wind and movement in it. Now, would this be located in real space and time? This came from a photograph of uh, a scene on the Connecticut River. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did modify a few things, like the trees and, mm -hmm. of course, the color in it. But, of um, course, because we see purple, a purplish blue in the tree. Yeah. Right, and right. Yeah. that's not necessarily what most of us think about in nature. Could you talk a little bit about your observation and then your interpretation? Well, I think that I look to nature for the shapes and the sense of feeling. And uh, the color is something that comes. That is extremely intuitive. <laughs> now, Picasso says that uh, painting is a lie that brings us closer to the truth. He actually uses mm -hmm. the word lie in Spanish. I think maybe the word deception would be better. So in some ways, is that where painting is going? You know, it's more about uh, not reality, but a reflection of reality or maybe a transformation of reality I think in some kind of way? I think that's very true. Um, I think that if you try to represent reality, well, it isn't. I mean, Picasso is just amazing. He's, uh, he's one of the people I quote quite often when I'm talking to my students who are beginners because uh, I think one of the dangers with being a beginner is you're afraid. And uh, <laughs> particularly with watercolor, uh, it's, it's a wonderful medium to work with, but until you learn how to handle that brush and handle the uh, paint, it can be a little scary. And I basically quote Picasso and I say, uh, he who can, can, and he who thinks he can't, can't. Right. And it, that's an important concept. So. As far as I'm concerned, pretty much anything Picasso says is right on <laughs> when, it, when it comes to art. <laughs> well, he also says there's no such thing as a, a straight line. So, uh, I mean, in some ways, I think it's interesting, the, the two artists that we have here today, because there's a lot of contrast, and yet there's a lot of similarity. Would you agree? Yes. I, I, I think that we're going with the same starting point of, you know, letting 
the process happen and not be controlling of what is the outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, I always say to my students and I say to myself over and over again is that you submit to the process and you come to it with humility. Mm -hmm. And you're not there to produce this beautiful thing. If it happens in the end, then it's a bonus. Mm. If it didn't, then you just spend well, talk about some beauty. time. Talk about beauty. What is beauty, anyway, in terms of what I you're was... doing here? <laughs> no. Ooh, that's a tough that's question. That's a tough question. Well, I, I think you, they I like say to... beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, right, but I think that it, there's so many elements of, um, uh, how shall we put it, um, symmetry or, mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, but I mean, what is beautiful to anyone is right. really, really so individual. Right. You know, and so I, I may have some of my pieces that I just really like and I adore it and not too many people will respond to it or they will, but right. they'll pick something out that I'm thinking, really? Yes. Right. <laughs> you know, I have a shoe box where I put a lot of things that I think were not the bonus and then I'll pull it out, you know, maybe to show something and they'll say, oh, can I do that cake? And, 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 oh, that, that's really wonderful. And I'm going, oh, my gosh. You know, it's really in the eye of the beholder. It does well, Surat says they you complain. should throw lines to the right side of the canvas or to the painting or the drawing, and that it creates an up, uplifting feeling. Now, maybe there's an emotional response there. I don't know what to make of that. It's probably a bunch of hokum, but... I have tried it a few times, and it does seem to get people feeling a little bit better when the lines are moving to the right in a kind of a, a balanced way. So, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of technical, I mean, from my point of view, looking at your work, it's highly technical, but it's also very spontaneous and, quite frankly, beautiful, you know, because you respond to it in ways that you're not really sure what it is that's happening. Do you mm -hmm. feel that's what you're putting into the work, or am I reading, the, reading you wrong? No, um... You know, uh, if you like it, you like it, you know, and that's great. Right. Um, but one of the reasons why I do the work is for the same benefits that I hope my students will get, and that's being calm, relaxed, you know, having the uh, creativity begets creativity. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. And I know true. we're coming to the end of our time, and I wanted to just at this moment to say that uh, if anyone is interested in taking a watercolor class the West Hartford Art League offers it I teach on Monday night and um, I have a, a couple of people I think we teach watercolor during the day so we'd love to have you uh, get in touch with us and uh, find out more about what's being offered at the Art League yes thank you Carol and I also, also yes, um, Angela. If has, you want to ahead. find <laughs> me, I also teach out of my house, and I also teach through the library and through uh, continuing education. But if you go to zentangle.com and go through Learn, you have all the CZTs all over the world. So find West Hartford, and there I am. You have my email. You can contact me. When you me. say CZT, that would CZT be CZT certif certified Zentangle teacher. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And I also want to mention, again, the great exhibit at the West Hartford Library currently mm -hmm. of your work. Right. So how so, long is it going to be there? Uh, through the month of June. Okay. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And if there's any other final words that you want to say about students, about teaching. Oh, one of the things I'd like to say is that right now at the West Hartford Art League, there are a couple of exhibits in the galleries. Mm -hmm. And um, so usually it's... Uh, Thursday through Sundays, 1 to 4, that the galleries are open. I'd like to suggest that you get over there and take a look. That's wonderful. Thank you, Carol, very much. I know that uh, we want to thank very much the help that we have here at West Hartford Community Television with the, the coordinator, Jitu Huntley, and our camera people today, too. It's very it's just very gratifying for us to be able to have the show and to bring in guests who are local artists. Yeah, we really appreciate uh, that we're having this opportunity. And I think that, you know, all we can say is stay tuned to Arts Works. Mm -hmm.